it's about that. I want to talk to you a little bit about the illumination. Uh, first of all, I just want to just say praise the Lord. That was some good singing this morning, and uh, man, I enjoyed that. We were, some of those songs just really made me uh, think about um, the wonderful cross and the, the need to just die, right? And I was just thinking about some teaching that we've been going through in HBI, and just how over the years, through the centuries, uh, saints have been in very difficult situations to deliver us to where we are today and give us uh, the opportunity to come to a, a great church in the heart of America and be here to worship God freely. Uh, it is such a blessing to be part of what God's doing in time. And, uh, you know, there, throughout the years, uh, there's been a lot of people that uh, the only path um, was the cross. There was no liberty. There was no opportunity and to follow Christ was a very, very clear path, and it was a very clear cross. And yet today we're so inundated with so many other things that, that we often, uh, we, we have other things to choose other than the cross. And I think sometimes that's worse uh, than living in a persecuted state where you only have one choice to make. It's either Jesus uh, or bust. And, uh, and so I prayed this morning that as we sit here and we sing these beautiful songs, I was looking at the Amazing Grace in 1779. Right, born out of slavery and born out of uh, the conflict of of uh, how men mistreated other men and how Jesus Christ forgave people and set them free, bringing in the Philadelphian Church Age. And here we are, uh, you know, a couple hundred years plus later, singing these songs, uh, which were started with the revival in people's hearts. And so I pray this morning that God grants you and I an individual revival. Uh, as we uh, just continue to, to seek God's word, we, we're going to go taking it to the streets here later on. That's what this is about, uh, going on invitation. This isn't hardcore evangelism. This is really the easiest way possible. You're just inviting someone to a, a good time here at the church. Easy to do, and uh, I pray that uh, everyone gets excited about that and uh, gets involved in that today. Uh, just a lot of great things going on. It all really starts with the Word of God. When Paul wrote the book of Romans, he was sending it to one of the, the cities, uh, the key city of the world. I mean, it was the place. Rome, of course, the Roman Empire. Uh, we all know about the Caesars and, uh, and all the things that were going on in Rome. And, his, uh, and he understood, of course, it's important uh, to have a key church there, yet he himself had not yet been there. And, you know, it's, it's exactly what's going on in our world today. We have the Word of God. Jesus Christ has not come back yet physically, but He indwells in us. And we need to listen intently to the Word of God so that God can do a work in our hearts so that we can go forth with power, uh, love, and a sound mind because this world desperately needs it. And the world that we, live, that we live in is, of course, increasingly wicked, but it's no less wicked uh, than the world of Paul's day. And so the Word of God works in the first century, and it works in uh, the last century. It is God's Word. It is true. And so as we look in Romans this morning, I'm excited for the opportunity for us to, to dig into this book and continue our study. As last week, we saw liberation in the first seven verses, and we discussed that and how that fruit is the fruit of life that comes in Christ. We want to bear that fruit instead of the fruit of death uh, that comes through sin. Uh, and last week's sermon was, uh, as we talked about that, uh, Paul was really building upon Romans 6. Uh, we have a liberation to love God and see him bring forth fruit through this relationship with him. So we don't want to continue in sin that grace may abound. God forbid, right? We want to be set apart. We want to be sanctified. We want to be employed in the God's business. We want him to use us supernaturally. And, uh, of course, we're going to see as we get to the end of Romans 7 that we all struggle with that, right? That, the reality is that's, that if you're born again... That should be your heart's desire. Now, it doesn't mean you always execute perfectly. Uh, but the, our heart's desire should be that to, to be used of God, to be set apart for his purpose, to be filled with the Spirit so that we can bear the fruit uh, that God would have us to bear, to bring what? Glory to him, to bring back some glory to the place it belongs. It all belongs to, to him. And so if you have your Bibles, look in Romans chapter 7. We're going uh, to pick it back up in verse 1, and I'm only going to bring you down this morning <clears throat> through verse uh, 14 uh, and then I'm going to bust the word from there. Verse 1 of Romans chapter 7. Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law. So she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. 
Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should marry, be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We talked about that last week. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in oldness of letter, the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. What's, uh, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, and as we look at this passage, Lord, I thank you for the liberation that we have in Christ, to bear fruit unto him. And Lord, I thank you for the reality that you have given us illumination uh, through the law so that we can have a relationship with you as we come to repentance and deal with the sin, Lord, that uh, is so prevalent and exceedingly sinful, as this passage just says. Lord, we thank you for the reality that your, your love and your grace uh, is even more magnificent. It's even more, uh, it's, it's greater than all of our sin, as the old song says. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for the opportunity to be liberated, to be free today to invite other people into a relationship with you. And Heavenly Father, we pray this morning as we look into this passage, Lord, that you truly would uh, open up our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things from the Word of God this morning, that we would be filled with the Spirit, that the light of your Word would just fill us up. And as we go out of here, Lord, we'd radiate life and light that comes from on high. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you for the privilege of gathering together. We ask your blessing upon the reading, the hearing, and the living and the application of the Word of God this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I would tell you to be seated, but you already are. So uh, I won't do that this morning. Okay, Romans chapter 1. I want to just review with you what we learned last week. So last week when we came together, uh, we saw that, that Paul asked some key questions in Romans 7 1. And uh, he was asking the, the audience there, which was Jewish, um, th- about the law. And he asked them, Does it have dominion over someone? As long as they live, and of course it does. Well, when someone dies, of course they're free from the law. And we talked about that last week. As he addressed this key audience with this key question, those that were in Rome knew the law. Uh, Even if it was the law of Rome, they understood how that worked. Um, And then he uses this uh, key analogy of someone who is married. And we talked about that last week, that a woman who was married, and I use woman because that's who Paul used in in chapter 7, verse 4, a woman who is married is no longer uh, bound to the marital contract once her husband is dead. Once he uh, passes away, that contract then is expired. She is free uh, to remarry without any problems. Uh, of course, in the case of a Christian, it's in, in the Lord. they got to be married to a brother in Christ. And so Paul then leads us then to the key application in verse 4, where he says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that, that ye should be married uh, to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And that harkens back to what we saw at the beginning of Romans chapter 6, right? With baptism, it helps us remember what we see in the ba- baptism tank here. So our, our death is uh, just, because, just like Jesus Christ's uh, life is imputed to us, so is his death. So we're as good as dead, buried and resurrected. And so we're dead to the um, the penalty of the law because Jesus Christ has already faced it. And that led us to uh, really dwell on the reality of our life. As I concluded last week, I want you just to, to really, I wanted to leave you with this thought, which is that we need to make sure we're dwelling on deliverance and not death. Because when we dwell on deliverance, you know what that means? You're going to bring forth life. You're going to bring forth fruit. And we talked about how we bear fruit, right? We bear fruit through a relationship 
with the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. We are alive to Him. We have a living, live relationship that brings forth fruit unto life instead of fruit unto death. And we also know that, that uh, when we serve sin, sin brings forth what? Death. And so we're not, that's not even part of our new nature. And what we get into in Romans chapter 7, and we'll get into more next week, is this dual nature that we have uh, between the flesh and the spirit, the carnal and the spiritual. And so as we, as we desire on the inward to have fruit, do you desire to have fruit this morning? Do you want to love God? Do you want to be? You wouldn't be here on a Sunday morning if you didn't. I mean, you're, you're looking for something from God and his word. Right, you, you have a de- desire, right? And you may roll in and you may have stayed up too late. Your flesh may have got a hold of you and you did something you shouldn't have. You've been thinking something you shouldn't have thought and all that stuff. And you come here because you know what? You know that's not the life you want to live. And so you come in here and you want to get yourself straightened out so you can go forth regenerated, renewed. And I can't do that for you, by the way, but the word of God can, Right? Uh, Jesus can and obeying what God says it does, has an impact in, a, in our hearts and it does something in us to bring forth life and so what we got to do is got to get our minds straight that's why Paul wrote the book of Romans there is a battle that goes on and it's one in the mind you got to understand in these things and that's why he uses words in earlier in Romans chapter 6 like reckon and I'll touch on that here in just a moment and so this morning as we come to this passage and we, we, we understand that we're liberated, even though we don't always feel liberated, well, one, some of the reasons that we don't always execute the way we need to, right, is we got to be illuminated. we got to be illuminated because we're creatures of habit. And, and we got to understand, we got to have some wisdom from on high because, you know, it doesn't, it's not in man's wisdom. It's not in what I've got. I don't have anything worthy to say to this morning. But the Word of God is, is so... Uh, so uh, um, now, how ineloquent can you be? I just lost my word. Uh, it's, so, it's so perfect in, in, in giving us exactly what we need to bring glory to him. God is a, he, he's a God of glory. And, we want, and we, we want to bring that glory to him. So when you look in verse 7 of the text this morning, Paul asks another key question. As we need to see some illumination uh, from the law. Now, we've been liberated from the law. And you'd almost think, if you just were kind of casually reading up to this point, that that, what the, well, then the law must be, and this is how as we think as natural man, we think, oh, the law must be bad. Uh, so uh, it had to die so I can be better. <laughs> You're wrong. You had to die. There's nothing wrong with the law. Paul asks this question, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul asks another key question here. Now, remember, he is specifically called out in verse 1, those who knew the law and in Romans 7, 1, because he's going somewhere with all this. It's going to carry us through Romans chapter 11. I'll build on that later. But in Romans chapter 7, he says, what shall we say then? This is the third of five times that he says that in the book of Romans. The first time was with Abraham. What should we say then, right, about Abraham and dealing with him being the father of being justified by faith without works of the law, uh, building on that concept of being justified by faith. And then, he, uh, then in Romans 6, one, he, he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And of course, you probably know the rhetorical answer to that question. And then in Romans 7 and verse 7, we see once again, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? And he has the same response as he did in Romans 6. God forbid. God forbid. Now Paul comes forth with the key answer. God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. So this is the sixth of ten mentions of this phrase in the book of Romans. God forbid. What, what this tells us is that God didn't give his son on the cross because the law was bad or that it was not sufficient. It tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to abolish the power of the law and replace it with the propitiation of Christ, the replacement of Christ, which would fi- that way we find ourselves free and alive in Christ. So the law wasn't bad. We were the ones that are bad. We were the ones with the problem. And we've already seen in Romans how God has already clearly shown us that. Therefore, the law is not bad at all, right? So John Cougar says what? I fought the law and the law won, right? Why did the law win? Because you're rotten. The law is going to win every time. It hadn't done anything wrong. You're the one that's done something wrong. So, but but we all are exceedingly sinful, and that's what the law shows us. 
See, the law eliminates. Oh, you thought we want to, when we talk about illumination, man, we want to we want to think about how enlightened we are. Well, do you know what the law does? It illuminates your depravity. It illuminates your sin nature. Well, who wants to do that? That's why we don't want to come to the law. That's why we don't naturally want to come to the word oftentimes. Because, because the first thing you're going to see is that you don't measure up. And so when you're lost, I was lost. Anyone ever been lost? I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm kind of kidding. Maybe you are lost. But when I was lost, before I knew Christ, right? I don't want to be around Christians. I don't want to be around church folk. Why? They make me feel bad. And then as soon as you can find a hypocrite, which you're sure to find, any, let's have you raise your hand on that. Anyone a hypocrite? <laughs> so as soon as you can find a hypocrite, what do you do? You throw aside the law of righteousness, right? And then you make them the law because that's a standard you think you might be able to top. Well, I could at least be better than that dude, you know, because he's, he's rotten and he goes to church. So now I don't need church and I don't, don't need them. Give me another beer, you know, and then you just go about doing your own thing because the chiefs are on later. Right? And, and then you just put it out of your mind. Why? Because, because the word of God illuminates. The, the law especially illuminates. And the problem with the law is it can show you're in the ditch, but it isn't a tow truck. It can't pull you out. Right? So you're stuck there. <laughs> it's just the way it is. So the law reveals sin. In verse 7, that's what's going on. He says, now God, don't, don't, blame, don't blame that dead man. Don't blame that law. Just because he's dead to you doesn't mean he was a bad guy. You need to go to his funeral and thank him <laughs> because that guy, he was, a lot better, he was a lot better husband to you than you were a bride. You didn't deserve that law. No. Isn't that crazy? You, you thought you were better than the law because he died, now you're free to go marry Christ. No, you weren't even worthy of the law, but Christ loves you so much, he's marrying you anyway. Isn't that something to think about? You're greatly loved this morning. You say, well, Brian, I'm a rotten sinner. Well, praise the Lord. So am I outside of Christ, my flesh. But when Jesus Christ sees, man, God loves you so much that he has outgooded your bad. That's terrible English, but good communication, right? <laughs> so you say, but Brian, I am the rottenest of the rotten. I'm the lowest of the low. I recently heard a testimony of a woman who had several abortions. And, 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 and several I know some of you in this room probably have had several abortions, right? There's certain things some of you may have engaged in in our culture. Taboo, bad. The law, the literal law, you know, the Cass County is coming down on you. Here come the cops and, and you violated the, the law of man. You violated the law of the culture. You violated the law of your conscience. You viol and you feel so low. You're like, man, there is no way I can get up out of the carpet. I'm lower than the, 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 the carpet pad. I want to crawl underneath the, the concrete. I just want, I'm just worthless. You know what? God loves you anyway. You can't out, you can't out bad his good. Now, if you're to that point and you realize how rotten you are, then why wouldn't you get saved? Because all you got to do is turn to him. It's faith. Because you got to believe that, then it's the other side of that coin. You got to believe that God really loves you enough in that condition that he would replace he would die on the cross for you. And why would he do that? Because it doesn't make sense. You try to find your value here, value here. You, can't get any, you don't even have self-esteem, as we call it in our culture. Well, who esteems you? God does. He loves you just as you are. Now, that's why us believers, us that are born that's why you can't look narrowly upon anybody and look down your nose at folks because if they're not born again, what do you expect? It's our fault, right? We got to get the gospel out because people are not going to be changed unless they are changed from the inside out, unless they understand who God is, how much he loves them. And sadly, there's many today who don't even understand the, the, they're depraved. They don't even understand that they've offended God. And that's why the law is such a great guy, because you got to bring the truth so people know that they're lost. You can't be saved until you know you're lost, Running around Walmart, you know, that's going to be me someday, I'm Alzheimer's. Running around Walmart, I'd be, it's open 24 hours, you know? You know, I'll just be walking around. Someone's going to say, hey, you belong in the nursing home. You're lost. This is not where you belong. That's what it's like when you're lost. 
The world leaves the lights on 24 hours and lets you run around like a rat in a maze until Jesus Christ find, until some, not usually, Jesus Christ usually calls you through circumstances, through people, but most importantly, through the word of God. And the message comes blasting in and you realize, wow, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. So the law reveals sin. The word sin means offense. In scripture, the Bible says in John, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but I want to give you the definition of sin because the law reveals sin. That's why the law is such a good guy. Uh, it's not that, that, that we're, it's bad, it's that we're bad. So, uh, but before I move on, I want you to think about this verse. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, many struggle with this verse because Romans clearly teaches us that the wages of sin is death. So how can the wages of sin be death, and all unrighteousness be sin, and there be a sin not unto death? That's kind of crazy. And see, that's why you say, well, see, that Bible doesn't make any sense. That's why I don't go to church, see? A bunch of men wrote it. You ever heard that kind of stuff? And that's because you haven't read it thoroughly and given God the benefit of the doubt. Because there's an answer. Some sin, like suppressing the call of the Spirit to save you from eternal damnation, leaves no other room but death. If you resist the call of God this morning, you say you're not saved and you need to be born again, or maybe those terms don't ring with you. Let me rephrase that. Maybe you're at a place in your life where you need to confront the reality that there's nothing you can do to be right with God other than trust Jesus Christ alone, his death, burial, and resurrection for your salvation. And the Spirit of God is pressing that upon you. As Mark Blanchett would tell you, for week after week, God was just pressing upon the back of your head. Isn't that right, brother? Just saying, you need to be saved. You need to be saved. You need to... He had all the answers, but he wasn't born again. And so if the Spirit of God's doing that, and you come to the point in your life where you say, no, I will not go. Well, guess what? There's no more room. Because that is the way, the truth, and the life. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. The Bible calls that blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. You don't want to do that. You don't want to resist the Holy Ghost unto death because there's no, word, there's no other sacrifice for sin. You must be born again. When, when we say that, we're not just saying you must be born again because you must be born again. You must be born again. That's why we're taking it to the streets because we, we want to be friendly to our neighbors. We want to have a good reputation. We want all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, people must be born again. And if we love them, my goodness, how can we not share the good news? We're all messed up. Likewise, we know from our study in Romans that the transgression uh, of the law clearly condemns us because in 1 John 2, verses 1 through 2, we have an eye advocate with the uh, Father. We have propitiation, which is also mentioned in Romans 3.25 and speaks to this. So though our sin is completely offensive to God... And he cannot have anything to do with it. There is something that, that, that he gives us, and that is space to repent. Because the love of the Father has offered propitiation for our sins. So the death you deserve has been placed upon Christ, giving you space to repent and make the offense that's unto death the rejection of the loving sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And so what you have while you're breathing is an opportunity to repent. There is a, you do all kinds of sin but you're having an opportunity to be saved. Because why? Jesus Christ has already, already died for it. And so you need to have that illumination that you can get from the law, that first that you're lost. Why? So that you can turn to Christ and be saved to avoid the penalty of sin, which is certain death. Now, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So, so sin is simply that transgression of the law. It's like going over 55, right, or 70 or whatever. I probably did that today, right? And uh, I'm not dead yet, but by the grace of God, Jesus Christ has already paid for that penalty. Now, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, right? We need to rein that thing in. We need to walk in the Spirit. And so we need to have an understanding that those things are in place. Why? For our benefit. Now, you might remember the Garden of Eden. The knowledge of the tree of good and evil revealed some information and changed the way God related to men. In Genesis 3.11, the Bible says, And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? 
Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now Adam knew that he had sinned, and he hid himself because he transgressed the one, the one commandment God had given him. Right? We talk about the Ten Commandments. Man, we could, Adam couldn't do, deal with one, and nor could we. And so, and so regardless of that one commandment of the, of the Ten Commandments, the re- reali- or the Ten Commandments, the reality is that the human nature cannot keep the law, but that does not make the law bad. Our natural man is offensive to God. It is the goodness of the command that reveals our wicked nature <clears throat> that the, the desire of the tr- of that that is our desire, I'm sorry, to transgress the law, even if it's only one law. So it, th- let me say that again, because I kind of botched the way I, I said that. I want to read this to you. It is the goodness of the command that reveals our wicked nature, that is our desire to transgress the law, even if there's only one. How depraved are we? Don't think you're better than Adam. You think you're better than Adam? I don't think you're better than Adam. I don't think I'm better than Adam. If there's one law, there's something in us that says, you know what, I want to break that one law. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to test that. And what happens is you get slayed. The law reveals our lust. It does. Paul, Paul appeals to the ten, uh, tenth of the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Now look back in our text in verse 7. He says, God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. law the law revealed it, for I had not known lust, except the law had said... 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet. Now Paul leaves off the discussion of the neighbor's wife for the broader sense that applies to all, both men and women, young and old. But covetousness is the core problem with the human condition. It is covetousness that causes us to desire nouns. I was putting this together. I thought, you know, that's a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a new understanding of nouns. You know what? Covetousness causes us to want nouns. What do you mean? You just fill in the gaps, a person, place, or thing, right? And we put it above God. I was sitting there. I had a list. You know, I had a list that was this long. It was going down my arm. Then it went across the floor, went out in the street. All the things, man. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to call the noun, a person, place, or thing that we exalt above God. And the law comes in and says, hey, listen, you're wanting something that you don't need. God, and, and it isn't God. It's a person, place, or thing that's been forbidden. And, and the law reveals that to us. Ahead of God. We, we put those things ahead of God. So covetousness, covetousness was revealed before the law was even violated. We know, that the text in, we know uh, from the text in Genesis that Eve desired the fruit because she desired to have what she thought uh, <clears throat> or was led to believe she didn't have. And of course we know that was the knowledge, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Something was going on with Eve in Genesis 3.6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. They were covetous. Why? They wanted something that they did not have. She wanted to be wise. But weren't you doing pretty good as you are? And of course, we know that the devil beguiled her. We know that uh, that, uh, Adam was responsible. And so he, he ends up uh, dealing with that. But Satan was also covetous of God's glory. And you guys know the passage, most of you, from Isaiah 14, 13. Uh, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Now, how many of you just want to run your life? Sometimes that noun is just I. That noun is me. Uh, I was introduced to that term and I use it. Now I got my son using it and I like it. Uh, me monster, right? Our kids are little me monsters, right? And we want to break that pattern of being little me monsters. But what happens in reality is we, as we go forward in life, let's just be honest, oftentimes we are me monsters. We want to serve us. And so that noun gets in the way is, is us. And the law is like looking in the mirror. What's my problems, God? Why is everyone so mean to me? Why is life so hard? And you finally look in the mirror and you go, oh, I'm the one who's filthy rotten. I want to blame everybody else so I can make myself feel better. But what you're trying to tell me is that at the core of who I am, I have things that need to be fixed that only God can fix. I have a sin issue. And only God can fix it. 
Now, I've already told you the law is the tow, it's not the tow truck, though. It can't pull you out of the ditch. And so, and so Paul offers some personal illustration. But before I get to that, it's even possible that you sit here and you listen to this sermon. And as you sit here, you're covetous of someone or something. And in your soul, you become restless and resentful because you think, what? I deserve something someone else has, and they don't deserve that because I deserve it more. Now, I know nobody in here would ever do that. But you know what? People think like that. We get to those places. And, and, and you know what that is? That is lust. That's what Paul says. You know what? If it wasn't for the law, I wouldn't have really grabbed a hold of how lustful I am, how lustful my flesh is. So Paul offers some personal illustration. And he explains, look in verse 8, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought, now this is personal, in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Paul's not holding back. He's not saying, I'm holier than thou. He says, all man- manner of concupiscence, all manner of, of you know, lust was in me. All kinds of lust was found in me. So this verse must be cross-referenced with Romans 3.20. Flip over to Romans 3.20, which isn't far. Romans 3.20, and, and look on that, in that verse. It says, therefore, <clears throat> by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law of, is the knowledge of sin. The knowledge of sin. So if it, if it were not for the law, sin would, be, would not be imputed. Now, Romans chapter 5 and verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So because of the law worketh wrath, Romans 4.15, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So sin is not imputed without the law of the conscience or the law of Moses, right? And so when that law comes, we die because it's right and we're wrong. Now, the problem is knowing we are sinning. <laughs> now, wouldn't that be good if just knowing we are sinning was enough to stop us? Like, thou shalt not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That should do the trick. Thou shalt not do harmful things to your body. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not. Right, if, if the law itself was enough to stop us, that would be awesome. Nothing wrong with the law. But that's how we know the problem is with us, because we still like to do things we shouldn't. Our flesh certainly does if you're born again. So the problem is knowing that we're sinning (laughs) and that doesn't stop us from sinning. Therefore, we see the issue. Something is wrong with us. Sin, not the command. Sin is the problem and we are the owner. And so we see that when we are sinful, it's not the conscience's fault or the law's fault. It's our sinful condition and therein lies the problem. So James says the law is like a mirror. Look over in James chapter 1. I want you to turn over there. James chapter 1. Because we buried that guy. I thought, man, I, I could, I, and we're married to Christ, so we should be so much better. Well, really, uh, we are because of Christ, but our flesh still stinks. Our flesh still stinks. Look at James chapter 1 with me. James 1, and look down here in verse 23. <clears throat> For if any be a hearer of the, the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. I like that word natural. Paul's going to use the word natural man, right? James says your natural face. The face that, that you're looking at my natural face, but inside me is the spirit of God. I have a supernatural face and I have a natural face, Okay. And so you have, he's, he's talking here about the natural face. Looking in the mirror, it's like a glass. You see, what do you see? You see the natural face, the natural man. When you look at the law, you get to see how rotten you are. Look in 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his face, or I'm sorry, his natural face in a glass. 24. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. We get amnesia. We get an amnesia. You can see your dirty face in the mirror, but you really can't clean it. And so what we often want to do, and this is where the law leaves you. This is why it's limited. You can look into the law and you can see your filth, but you can't clean it. So what do you do? You walk away and you forget about it. You just walk off. Why do we do that? Well, 
Because we don't want to deal with it. You say, but Brian, I do want to deal with it, like the Apostle Paul. So i got a bag here. I don't know what this is. But let's pretend it's a mirror, right? And I look at it and I go, oh my gosh, I need to get that filth off. Huh, like my dog, my do- this is funny, my dog sees its reflection in the mirror, or in the door, and just goes crazy barking. She's scared of herself, it's funny. But anyway, so you look in the mirror and you go, ah, I'm filthy. Well, let me, maybe I can get that off. I'm going to attack that mirror. And you start, start rubbing that stuff. Guess what, is that going to take the dirt off? No. It's just going to smudge the mirror. The, the law can't clean you up. Well, man, maybe if I just break that thing... Now, guess, guess what? You're going to be bloody. You're filthier. You're bloody. You're cut up. The law is going to slay you. You're going to bleed out. You're going to bleed to death. You, see, you can see your dirty face in the mirror, but you can't clean it with the mirror. So if you try to rub your filthy flesh against it, you're just going to end up having a dirty mirror. So if you break the glass and do that, you're going to have a bloody mess. So you see, the mirror was not designed to clean you up. It was designed to reveal to you what you really look like like in the light of God's glory. It's only... I'm I'm not going to leave you there. But wouldn't that be depressing if I just said, Amen, let's go home? Whew, boy, I just want to... You've got to find another church. I mean, that's terrible. So no, I'm not going to leave you there. Why? Because what does God say? What are we to do? We need the water of God's word. We need the water. The word. Jesus Christ is the word of God. When you complete the whole of the picture, when you get the New Testament, you put it on the back end of that Old Testament, guess what? You have Jesus Christ, the water. Of the word. He's the one who can cleanse us. Jesus Christ is the atonement. All that stuff in the Old Testament about sacrifices, 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 atonement, 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 priesthood, priesthood, priesthood. What is that? That's all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He is the water of the word. He has purchased us and washed us clean of our sin. Isn't that liberating? Woo! Yes, it is. I'm excited about that. So you can be clean. Therefore, we see that the law is not bad. We are bad. For the saved, that means our flesh is bad and our soul is saved. Praise the Lord. The law is simply the mechanism God uses to reveal or illuminate the sinful nature. So Galatians 3.24 says this, and we covered this when we went through Galatians. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, what? To bring us unto Christ, that we might be, using the book of Romans, justified by faith. And that's why Paul's bringing this back up in Romans chapter 7, because he's already told us and shown us that we must be justified through faith alone, through Jesus Christ, our sacrifice for sin, our propitiation. He's already covered all of that. And so then, if you're Jewish, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 1, what do we do with the law? Hey, you know what? What we don't do, we're free from the law. It's great, but we got something better, and that's Jesus Christ. We're justified by faith. You can see from Galatians 3 and verse 24 that the law was never intended to save, but simply lead us to the one who could save, and of course, that is Jesus Christ. So that introduces us to another key phrase. Look in verse 8. Not of James, but of Romans. Romans chapter 7 and verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. Skip on down to verse 11. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Twice here you see the word taking occasion. Taking occasion. Taking occasion by the commandment. Sin utilizes this occasion, and it wants to kill you. Uh, Your flesh wants to destroy you, but fortunately, it's already been destroyed. The impact of your flesh, if you're born again, has already been taken care of. But you're you're in a great wrestling match because it doesn't want to see you succeed. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, Paul said in verse 8, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. There was all kinds of work going on. Uh, And this is, I believe, he's talking here uh, before he was uh, obviously saved. All manner of lustful desire. Sin takes advantage of the commandment to work and work this out. So a revival of sin means an arrival of death. And that's what you see in verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And I died. You know how it is. Everyone lives that story. I'll get to that in just a moment. Of when you know you're a sinner. I've told the story before of being, uh, and I'm not saying this is the first time, but I remember when sin really set in on me. I stole a corncob pipe at 
at the Six Flags in Texas. And I didn't know I'd stole it yet. I just thought they were there and they were free. And my, boy, my dad came down so hard on me that I thought, I thought it was the second coming. I didn't know what that was yet. But uh, <laughs> I tell you what, I just, I was like, oh, what have I done? You know, and I went back and I put the pipe back up and I was all freaked out. You know, I knew that day I sinned. I had transgressed the law. Even though I didn't know the law, I broke it. And I never forgot that. You don't thieve, man. You're not a thief. Your dad will look at you narrowly. It just broke my heart. And so, um, and so that's, that's definitely uh, what happens. There's, there's sin. As it has a revival in your life. You know what happens when you, when you sin once you broke the law? Because I was lost once. This is what happens. Because you, you have these standards. And you, you, outside of all the Bible, you don't, you've never been to church. right? You're just like, kind of like I was. Very little church, just a lot of life. And so you're rolling through life and you have these standards. But once you start breaking your own rules, you know what? You break your own rules, it, you just start spiraling. You just spiral into depravity. And if you're honest with yourself, you know I'm telling you the truth. Once you, because you have this standard, it's in your conscience. Even if you've never been to church, there's going to be doors that you knock on today. People that are, their lives have spiraled into depravity. And they feel like there's no hope. They feel like, you know what, I've broken the law, I've tried, I can't do it. And you know what, they're right. They can't do it. That's why they need the love of God. They need the goodness of God. They need to acknowledge God. They need to return to Christ. Because of him, they can be saved. That's what happens to sin. It brings all manner of concupiscence. Paul says, you know what it did? Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, it deceived me. It slew me. A preacher said, sin deceives you by leading you to believe you can sin without impunity. Sin deceives you by leading you to believe that your actions won't hurt anyone else. Sin deceives you by leading you to believe you won't give an account. Sin deceives you by leading you to believe God doesn't know about it or won't pay attention to it or remember it or will overlook it. Sin deceives you by making you believe it can satisfy Sin deceives you by telling you that you can stop whatever you want to. And you know what sin is? Sin's a liar. If you keep hanging out with sin and you never come to the place where you repent and turn, turn to Christ alone for salvation, let him be your satisfaction, you will be dead. And not only in the ground six feet under, but for all of eternity. Sin is a deceiver. Sin is a deceiver. Every believer then as we understand, has reenacted Genesis chapter 3. Before, ever, before Eve ever took the bite of the forbidden fruit, you know what? She did some things that really weren't too cool. It was not until she took of the fruit and broke the one command that the fruit slew her, right? That the sin slew her. But before that ever happened, she was willing to consider that God was holding out on her. And she doubted in her heart the character of God. Not good. Uh, before she ever took of the fruit, she listened to accusations against the Creator, God, and His character. She heard accusation. God had not said that. That's not what He meant. She let people slay His word and twist it. And she stood by and thought, hmm, maybe He's, maybe so. Well, so let me do this. Let me change the word. Then she changes the word. He didn't even do, he did, she did worse than he did. He just questioned the word. She's the one that changed it. So all that went on before she ever took of the fruit. Before she ever, she ever actually broke the law, something went wrong in her heart. There wasn't a penalty, though. It wasn't imputed until she actually broke the law. You know what that was? That was a space for repentance. And while I'm on that subject, it may have been a space for her husband to jump in and save her. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't just ignore the Father? Aren't you glad the Father loves us and didn't just let us go off the cliff into depravity into eternal hellfire as he could justly have done with no problems at all? And not even had thought about it? Not even had an inkling of a conscience that was defiled? He could have done that, but instead he does craziness and he loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He stepped in there and said, whoa, we're going to give these folks an opportunity to love here. I'm going to fill up a third of the sons of God with some love creatures, some people here that will love something that you angels haven't really caught on yet, but you just watch and see how this works. 
And that's what happened. Don't blame the law. Paul gives his personal testimony of how he was alive without the law once, as we've all been. Then he describes that state of all people before the age of accountability. When Paul became old enough to understand the command, the command slew him. So don't blame the law. He's that good guy. Look in verse 10. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. I say it like this because the analogy Paul used in verse 3 uh, over there in verse 3 where he says, So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, so she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Last week I used the analogy of Abigail, but we really know Abigail. The law's a good guy. He was no Nabal. And so <clears throat> just because the law is dead... To you doesn't mean the law was a bad thing. It means it is sufficient to show us sin, but it cannot save us from sin. So Paul mentions here, the commandment is ordained to life. It is not created or intended to kill. It is, it is dead and, and we are free to marry Christ, but the law was a great thing. It was ordained to life. That's a really important verse there in Romans chapter 7 and verse 10. The law was ordained to life, lest you somehow... Uh, be like Eve in the garden and start to wonder, well, maybe God wanted us to be slain by the law. No, the law was ordained to life. It, its purpose was to bring life. Now, Paul takes, a, takes a, up the law in Romans chapter 7, verse 12. The law and the commandment are holy. So this is the way it works. In verse 12, he says, Wherefore, the law is holy, the commandment is holy, and just and good. He defends the law as we ought. And so what, what is the deal here? Well, this is how it works. When, you're, when you tell your kids, don't play in the street, what are you telling them that for? Just because you're a mean parent and you want to instruct and impose your will over there so they can't do what they want. No, that's what, the, that's what the flesh says. That's what the natural flesh says. That's what your kids think. But you know in your heart, why did you tell them not to play in the street? Because you don't want them to die. That law was intended for them to not die. Don't go out and get ran over by a car. You know, is your underwear clean? Okay, so... <laughs> You know, so that's why, that's why you give that law. You, you lay that law down not to bring death, but to avoid death. You've all heard that too, huh? You don't want your kids playing in the street because they'll die. And that's exactly the way the law works. Once we hear the law uh, say it's dangerous to play in the street, don't play there. You know what happens in our sinful hearts? We get resentful. Well, who are you to tell me I can't play in the street? Because you know, I'm smart, and I can see when the cars come, and you know what? I can go out in the street, and you know what? If you're not looking, and you know what? You know what? That's a sinful man. I can go have sex and not get caught. I can go do this, and nothing's going to happen. I can do this. Why? Because I'm so smart. Yeah, I know. I know how it goes. You're not that smart. You can fool me all day long. I'm not that smart. If you want to talk to someone, I'm not smart, okay? Fool away. You can fool the old preacher. But you know what? You can't fool God. He knows what's up. And, who you really, and, what, and when you take the time to really look at why you do what you do, you realize the problem is not the rules. The problem is the rule breaker. This means the law is holy, it's just, and it's good. And of course, we are the ones with the problem. So now we clearly see the reason for the law in verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? Oh, God forbid, second use there in this chapter. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin, might, by, the command, or that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. What? Yeah, he wants you to see how rotten you really are. The commandment reveals, it illuminates the sin the, so that it's exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Next week when we get together, we'll talk about that. Because you know the reality is, if you're born again, you're dealing with this flesh every day of your life. And the longer you're saved, you know what you realize? The more you're in the Word, you know what you realize? the more exceeding, sinful this old carcass is. The heart is, is, is deceitfully wicked, right? 
above all things. Who can know it? And if you're born again, you don't need a lesson. You already know what I'm telling you is true. You probably could preach it better than I could. We understand those things. But maybe this morning, maybe you come in here and you really never considered how exceedingly sinful you really are. And I'm not judging you. Because I'm going to jump up and say, well, if you're exceedingly sinful, I'm equally or better. Okay? So we can get into a sin fest here. Let's not, that won't glorify God. Let's just leave it at that. God is holy. And for him to have fellowship with us, we need, we need an advocate. We need a propitiation, and that is Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning God is calling you to turn, to really believe in your heart, in your core, that Jesus Christ really is who he said he was. That the events of 2,000 years ago really did have an impact on you. And it's not just some story, not some, not some uh, thing that's made up, not just some book that some dudes put together, but literally Jesus Christ was God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again the third day, and that if you by faith trust what the word of God says about not just your sin, but about the solution through Jesus Christ, the word of God, he will wash you clean. And when you look in the mirror, you'll see the perfect law of liberty. The old man is gone, and there's a new man in its place. That man is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And you now are illuminated, not by the law to reveal your sin, but by the Lord Jesus Christ himself from the inside out to shine forth his light. The good news is in you. If you're born again this morning, can you say hallelujah? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are, no, we are no longer bound as slaves. That we can choose now to follow Christ. We are free from the law of sin and death. All we need to do is make sure that we're communion, that we're filling up the spiritual man, that we're spending time in the word of God, that we're, we're spending time with him. Why? So that we can bear the fruit, the fruit, the fruit that brings honor and glory to him. And that's why we're going out to, today to invite people to come, to come, not to just a harvest party, though that's a fun thing to do. It's not to expand the church uh, as far as our name or whatever, it's to magnify Christ. Amen. It's to bring Jesus Christ into contact with people who are so either oblivious to their sin nature or so depraved that they think they can't get out that we can offer them the love of Christ and they can find their way home to heaven with Jesus Christ. You can't really have liberation until you have illumination. Many try to deceive themselves in believing that, now I'm a good guy, I'm a good gal. Uh, No. You know who's a good guy? The law. That's a good guy. And we don't measure up. You know who a good guy is? Jesus Christ. That's who a good guy is. He'll save you from yourself. He loves you despite yourself. He'll redeem you. Allow the illumination of the law to point you to the illumination of Christ. Today, we're going to invite these folks to our harvest party. You know what these represent up here? 1%. I made sure we had at least 1% of the population of Cass County. Just laying up here in these little things. It's possible very easily that our little church could go out and touch 1%. Out of the 100,000 souls in Cass County, we could go out and invite them. Just show some friendship to them and the love of Christ. 1%. Doesn't sound like much, does it? But I'll tell you what. It doesn't take much of the blood of Christ to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Why? Because he is holy. He's holy. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne this morning, as we prepare our hearts 